Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about authentication, especially passwords. It's, authentication is a huge subject. I cannot cover it all uh, in, in one lecture. I hope I'm not going to run over. I'll try not to, but uh, I'm not even really going to have very much time at all. I'm not even going to go into issues with public key uh, cryptography and certificates, which is a whole separate topic and a separate chapter in my books. So. Uh, when we do authentication, conventionally we speak of three different ways to authenticate. Something you know, like a password, something you have, some sort of token or some other, some other object that you carry, or something that you are, some characteristic of your body. It's cor that division into three parts is uh, correct as far as it goes, but what it ignores is the fact that authentication is a systems problem, like much of the rest of security. It's not just, do you know a password? Do you have a token? Do you have the right fingerprint? It's how you put all the things together, including provisions for forgotten passwords, lost tokens, and injured body parts, uh, and compromise. We know that Password files have been compromised on many different major sites. Because of the composition, because of all these different parts that have to be put together, you don't get security just by having one piece of them very strong. You have to get them all correct and all working together properly. So, passwords probably the most familiar method of authentication to most people. Everybody understands them. If you're going to go put up a new website, unless it's a very high security site, that's probably going to be what you go for. Because it seems to be cheap, it seems to be easy, and you don't have to train people on how to use passwords. At most, you've got to talk about whatever your peculiar rules are for how to create a strong password. Your users, though, will basically understand the problem. But there are lots of troubles with passwords. For one thing, people forget them. If you're going to put up a website or even dealing with employees, people will forget their passwords. This is especially true the uh, first few days after you've required people to change their password. You know, I. I spent a year working for the U.S. government a couple of years ago. Which had, you know, every month I had to change my password, a dubious concept as we'll see later. And I learned I should change my password on a Monday so I'd have several more days of using it on a daily basis. If I changed it on a Friday, by Monday it was gone. <laughs> a second problem is that people pick weak passwords. One, two, three, four, five, password, one, two, three, four, five, six, probably here, Sisma. You know, people, people don't, you'd think that it was their bank account they try to protect it, but that doesn't seem to be true either. People are just going to pick bad passwords or the repeat passwords. The same password you use for Facebook, you use for your bank account. It's easy. You don't, how many passwords can you remember? People share them. You know, when I worked at AT&T, uh, I know that the director of the lab's uh, administrative assistant knew his passwords. So if he was out, she could read his email and answer his email. Or, oh, you know, I, I, I got to get to Netflix, but my subscription's expired. Can I borrow yours? Sure, here's my password. What's the problem? People write them down, which you're advised not to do. That's a question we'll revisit. It's not clear that it's a bad idea. And passwords can be replayed by attackers. If you capture a password through a keystroke logger or a phishing site, you've tricked somebody, this password is good for reuse in uh, many different times and, of course, many different places because of this reuse property. So passwords have a fair number of weaknesses as well. You know, the most common ad security advice we see on passwords is pick strong ones. For those of you who don't know what the piece of antique technology is on the right, that's an ASR Model 33 teletype. I last used one, oh, 45 years ago or so. Not quite the same model teletype that 
uh, Ritchie and Thompson used when creating Unix. They used a more advanced one that had lowercase letters, but about the same sort of thing. 1979, Bob Morris, Ken Thompson wrote a classic paper on password security, password insecurity. And this set out most of the problems with passwords. Uh, but it's, you know, this is 1979. That was a long time ago in the computer world. They were working with hard copy terminals, electromechanical terminals with absolutely no computational ability. Keystroke loggers and fishers didn't ex phishing didn't exist. There were no websites. There was no networking for most people. You know, phishing you. You got to the right side on the ARPANET if you were one of the very few people who could use it. But there were no banks there. Keystroke loggers, how are you going to go inject software to an electromechanical terminal? It wasn't part of the threat model. And most users had only one or two passwords because there just weren't that many computers that you would have access to. A power user might have three or four. By actual count, last week, I, added up, I have more than 200 web passwords right now. Uh, why should the advice that they gave in 1979 in a very, very different computing environment you know, this is 35 years ago. How many Moore's Law doublings has it been since then? In, th in 35 years? Why should we think that the advice that we got then is still valid? It turns out that some of it still is, but some of it we need to revisit. The old threats, the threats that they were trying to counter, other than a plain text file somehow being leaked from a backup tape or a programming bug or so on, was a hacker stealing a file of hashed passwords from a time-sharing machine that had at most one to 200 users in the system password file. And the attacker had limited CPU resources because there wasn't that much CPU power available by today's standards. How can you break into a machine if it's not networked? Well, pardon me, there was some networking. There were dial-up modems running at 300 bits per second. If you were a power user on a high-end site, it might have been 1,200 bits per second. But I, oh, when I was in grad school, the director of the computer center really didn't think you needed anything faster because people can't read faster than that. What's the point of a higher speed net uh, connection? I, I, I kid you not, that was literally his answer. So the attacker didn't have access to very many computers to crack passwords. The threats today are rather different. For one thing, it's not the system password file that's being compromised, it's the application password file, the web application especially, or the banking application. Despite the very good advice from Morris and Thompson of not to store plain text passwords, many sites still do. Why? For password recovery. People forget their password. Oh, answer a few simple questions or click here and we'll email it to you. Your password in plain text. Oh, oh yeah, that's the, that was the password I used for this site. Password number three of my four passwords. <laughs> and how do you do this password recovery other than click here and we'll mail it to you? The secondary authentication questions. Well, you know, if you've got a free website, an advertising-supported website, you can't really expend a lot of effort on password recovery because it's going to cost you too much. You're not making very much per user. You want the users to come to your site. You don't want them to create a new login because then you lose all that valuable advertising history. So there are these standard password recovery questions. Come back to those, but those are basically jokes because they're too easy for people to figure out. We have malware planting keystroke loggers, phishing sites collecting passwords, and the attackers got botnets with GPUs, graphic processing units to do the crunching, and cloud services. You know the best way to do, uh, do a widespread password uh, cracking attack? Buy some time on Amazon's Elastic Cloud. Lots of CPU time, very, very cheap.
but was still told to pick three, you know, strong passwords, you know. Three letters, three digits, one symbol, one hieroglyphic, two, two Klingon characters, maybe something from Elvish. Yeah. <laughs> Never write down your passwords. You know, oh, that's fairly sound advice. If you're being targeted by a foreign intelligence agency or if you're in a movie, you know, how many times has somebody broken into your house or apartment <laughs> with the goal of stealing the password that's next to your home computer just so they can get into your Facebook account. <laughs> you know, uh, the average burglar who steals your computer from your flat has got exactly one interest, reselling the hardware for about 10% of its value because that's about what they can get when reselling stolen computers. They wouldn't know how to resell passwords most of the physical burglars. Again, the advice is different if you're dealing with intelligence agencies. There was that Russian spy ring broken up in the U.S. a few years ago, and one of the things the FBI did to uh, get around the encryption was they did surreptitiously break into one of the suspect's houses and found a 26-character password as strong as you can possibly imagine on a post-it note on the bottom of the keyboard. The strength of that password didn't do them a lot of good, did it? But that's not the threat that most of us are facing. Even the password strength rules, unless you really do it well, not going to result, give you the results you want. So here is the actual advice from a US government website. In fact, I know there are at least two very different agencies that have these same rules. Minimum length eight, well that Length of eight came from this 35-year-old paper, so that's a little bit dubious. Maximum length of 12. If you start crunching the numbers on brute force attacks, 12 is far too short. I wouldn't suggest a password of less than about 14 characters today, never mind what you'll need five years from now. But the site caps it at 12. Why, I don't know. And then avoid patterns. Maximum repeated characters, two. Okay, fine at least one letter, at least one digit, can't have your username, here's a large variety of symbols to choose from, no control characters, why, I don't know, and must start with a numeric character. Okay, now let's factor in people, the usability aspect of it. How are people going to react to this? This is a crazy set of rules. You've got to start with a number, and you know, half the time these days, you're logging in from your phone or something, rather than your laptop. So you want something that's easy to type on your phone as well. Well, you know, a keyboard, I just go reach a little higher up to hit a digit. On the phone, I have to go switch modes to the numeric keypad. So, okay, I gotta start with a digit. So maybe all of the digits I'm going to have in the password are going to be at the beginning and prop, maybe only one, yeah, that only says one. Then I'll switch to letters and type a few letters. In fact, I've got to get eight characters. I don't really want to type too much, especially on my phone where I'm making typographical errors constantly. So one to, one to six digits, you know, between six and one letters, and a special character. What character do we end things with? A period. You add this up, nice little equation over here, <coughs> 10 choices for the first digit, 26 choices of letters in between uh, one and six of them, and then the period at the end, you get five billion possible combinations. I guarantee a large percentage of the users of this site are going to have passwords that are in these five billion choices. Crazy set of rules, and, oh, and only five billion choices. That's nothing especially for anyone with any sort of self-respecting botnet. Oh, maybe use an exclamation point or a question mark. Double the number, triple the number. It's not a very large number. Once you take, the, the biggest contribution to this five billion is the 26 to the seventh. That's about three billion of it. Most people are not gonna pick stronger passwords because it's a nuisance, it's getting in their way, and this is the way to factor. Yeah, some people will. You will not get everybody's password out of these five billion choices. I guarantee you'll get at least two thirds. 
You know, I brought up my kids well. When my son was eight years old, he complained to me that his friends were using guessable passwords for their AOL accounts. <laughs> On the other hand, yeah, I brought both my kids well. They came to visit my office one day. They noticed the combination lock on the door, and he shoulder surfed it, and my daughter brute forced it, the combination. So I brought my kids up right. So why should we expect the same defenses to work? It's a wonderful paper by Cormac Hurley at Microsoft. There's several papers. For one thing, he calculated that it doesn't pay for people to remember their passwords for infrequently remembered sites. It's faster for them to go through a password recovery. Why? Because your time costs money too. Brain power costs money. And he also calculated password strength rules weren't worth very much because keystroke loggers and phishing sites were the cause of far more password compromises than stolen password files which is what the strong password rules were designed to defend against. Phishing sites don't care. You can type in anything you want. The very first phishing message I ever saw was from paypal.com. Even had a certificate. If you're looking very closely, you'll realize I cheated right over here. It's not paypal.com. Let me change the font and enlarge it. You can see what I really typed. That's paypa1.com. Yeah, that was the email message I got. Small screen, it's a little character. Doesn't care how good my password is. How's, you know, 17 characters uh, from 14 different languages. Phishing site captures it, just a string of bytes. The fishers have gotten even more clever. These days you can have arbitrary Unicode characters in a domain name. You don't. It, this place doesn't have to be T-E-C-H-N-I-O-N. You could write it in Hebrew characters. It would work. So here's PayPal, except it's mostly in Cyrillic. Cyrillic, even the letters that look the same as the Latin alphabet, have their own code points. Nothing that looks quite like the letter L. I suppose I could have used a digit one again, as opposed to ASCII. Oh, the slash in the URL. Oh, here's the host name, followed by slash on the real thing. So you can look at the real host name. That character that looks like a slash, which the Unicode standard calls a Salidas, so 002F, but the fraction slash, 2044, looks identical. Any Unicode character in the domain name, folks. Another difference in the environment today is Ritchie and Thompson were dealing with a world where most computer users were employees. And with employees, you can mandate certain standards of behavior, and you can train them. You must th sit through an hour of a year of computer security training. Try not to fall asleep too soon during the lecture. But here is this problem with guessable passwords. Here's what, how to do it. Today, of course, most users are your customers. And if your rules are too strong, you're going to scare them away. I can never remember my password for bookstorenumber1.com. I'll buy my books from bookstorenumber2.com. Make, they make it easy for me to log in. What's the problem? A recent study showed that the strongest password rules were imposed by government sites and employers where people don't have a choice about whether or not they use them. Stores, social networking sites, even banks where there's money at stake tend to have weaker rules because customers have a choice and they're going to go for the most convenient one. Once upon a time, banks would say, convenient, we're open late. Today it's convenient, we don't insist on strong passwords. They don't quite say it, but that's the way they behave. Another phenomenon we see is you must change your password regularly. People are stubborn. They will not cooperate with that. Because you forget your passwords, then you have to go fall back to the secondary authentication or calling the help desk if it's at work or what have you. Secondary authentication is very weak. So people use patterns. You know, 
if this week I used password 17, next month I will use password 18. One, two, three, four, five, period. One, two, three, four, five, comma. A paper a few years ago by Fabian Monroe's Mike Ryder and a few others at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill showed that they could algorithmically predict 41% of changed passwords and 17%, almost one out, of, you know, one out of six or so, in just in five or fewer guesses because people pick their new passwords according to patterns. And the more you try to put in rules stopping this pattern stuff, people will be very clever in their stupid password pattern choices. <laughs> you can make something foolproof, but you can't make it damn foolproof. Or the other way to phrase that is, you know, this is a race between one group trying to make something idiot-proof in nature trying to produce better idiots. <laughs> People don't believe in this, or we wouldn't see password in one, two, three, four, five, six as two of the most common passwords recorded. And what is the rationale for frequent password changes? It just somehow seems right. You know, tell me, do you change the locks on your house or your apartment door every six months? When was the last time you did it when you didn't actually physically lose a key? What's the rationale for it? It turns out, if you look historically, that in the 1980s, the U.S. Department of Defense put out a publication on passwords. It was a companion book, one of the companion books to the orange, to the orange book I mentioned yesterday. In fact, they had a whole series of books each with a different color cover called the Rainbow Series. I think this one, the password book, was lime green or maybe yellow. I don't quite know all the names, names of these shades of colors. They actually gave an equation for calculating the password change interval. And when you look at the equation, you realize that the values that you have to plug in are quite unknowable. Probability that the password has been compromised per unit time. Well, I don't know what the probability is. We don't have suitable data on that. Many of these things are never actually discovered. And other numbers like that, to say nothing of today's threat model like, what is the probability that your employees have fallen for a phishing attack? We don't know. I don't see it here in this room, but in the US, especially the UK, there are surveillance cameras all over the place. I get very nervous, or hotel room, meeting rooms. I get very nervous just unlocking my laptop in a hotel meeting room because of the cameras that are in there for the hotel security. Is that part of the threat model? It should be, at least for some attack kinds of attackers. You know, hotel video feeds presumably is going to the security office and mostly not looked at. Take a very high grade of attacker targeting me to grab my laptop and that video feed but you can come up with similar scenarios. So what is the threat model? Are we dealing with online or offline guessing attack? Offline guessing attack, someone has stolen the password file and is trying to crack your password. Online, they're trying to log in as you repeatedly. Well, we have a known defense against online guessing attacks, rate limited. How many guesses you can do per second? 10 wrong guesses, we're going to lock you out of your account. Great. Okay, here's the system, you know, here's the website administrator, probably has a nice web-based interface for doing this. They probably uses the same password as this person uses for their own login on this social networking site. Shouldn't, but you know, human nature being what it is, they do. So, let me try to log into the system administrator 10 times. Oh good, the account is locked. Now the administrator can't get in to lock me out. That problem has been known for at least 30 years. Are the attacks targeted or random? When I am going after a password, do I want to guess one person's password, one particular person's password, or any password on the system? Typical hashed password file, 
depending on the strength rules in the user base, it might be 60 to 70 percent of the passwords are guessable, but maybe not the one user you're targeting. On the other hand, if it's one user you're targeting, your whole botnet can be aimed at that one user rather than the hundreds of thousands or, t or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of hashed passwords you've just stolen. And what are the enemy's abilities? We can set a floor on the enemy's abilities by looking at the size of reasonable botnets or how many dollars of CPU time the attacker wants to buy on one of the cloud computing services, plus the GPU time and so on. But it's rather harder to set a ceiling on it. Just pick strong passwords gets all of this wrong. And we've got the problem of the many, many passwords we all have. I'm not going to ask people to embarrass themselves by saying, how many different passwords do you use? But for virtually everybody, it's far fewer than the number of logins they have. Some people say, this is my banking password, this is my social network password, this is my work password. I guarantee you're in a minority. But we're forced to pick strong passwords, if nothing else, by sites that enforce such rules. Reusing passwords turns out to be far more dangerous than picking weak passwords. Because if one of the websites you log into is compromised, or you're lured to a phishing site for one of these sites, then they have that password that can work on many other different sites. And your login name tends to be the same and may even be your email address, which is probably the same. We can't possibly remember all of these passwords. Nobody can. So you have to store them somehow. And now we've got this advice about don't write down passwords. Strong passwords, many of them, don't write them down, you can't remember. We're back to secondary authentication unless we store them. So we have to store them somehow. They've got to be stored securely. It's got to be stable storage. You don't want to risk losing your, set of your collection of stored passwords. And it's got to be usable. You don't want to have to go through a crazy process to go deal with your stored passwords. Oh yes, it's in the locked file cabinet on the other side of my office. And every time I need to go log in, I go to the file cabinet, unlock it, pull out the password store, log in, put it back in, because that's the company security rule, lock the file cabinet again. Not usable, not real, won't happen. A piece of paper is often a very good thing. It's usually secure unless it's somehow linkable to the resource being protected. You know, I'd never put the pin for my ATM card in my wallet because if someone steals my wallet, you know, oh, what's this number written on the back of the card, handwritten on the back of the ATM card? Okay. That's a pretty obvious threat. If I think that some intelligence agency or counterintelligence agency or police agency is after me, I'm not going to put, write down plain text passwords. The real problem is pieces of paper tend to get lost. Fold it in wallet, fold it and put it in your wallet. Uh, okay, fold, 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 unfold. Many times a day that piece of paper won't last very long. It's good enough for many purposes, but not for others. Again, do you usually use all of these logins in your living room at home, or you know, me in 17 hotel rooms a week, it seems, sometimes. The higher tech version of the piece of paper is a password manager. There are many of them out there today. We want it to be a secure password manager. That's not as easy as it seems. There were two papers that used Nick Security last month, which talked about security problems with password managers. But the real issue affecting both security and usability is that we, is what I'll call the nearness of the password manager to the browser. For usability, and I'll explain what I mean in a moment by nearness, but for usability you want it to be very near the browser, 
For security, you want it to be further away. Most password managers encrypt the passwords. Of course, this requires a decryption key. Typically, this is, of course, a password. But this is one password. It's only yours. You're only using it in one spot. It can and should be very, very strong. For many people, this is either the most or second most important password they will have. The other, it turns out, as we will see, is their email account password. But another problem we have that password managers have to address is synchronization. You want to be able to use your stored encrypted passwords on many different devices. I regularly use three different computers my laptop, my office desktop, another one, my study at home. I use one or two tablets. I use one or two phones. Oh, I'm sorry. Isn't it? There's a second laptop. I forgot about that one. Uh, I want to be able to get the passwords from all of them because I need to log into these sites from all of them. So I need some way to synchronize it. One popular choice is a cloud storage service like Dropbox which, by the way, is layered on top of Amazon's cloud storage service. So we've got several ways to attack. Attack the user, attack Dropbox, attack Amazon. Better be strongly encrypted with a good passphrase. Another is a USB device. This somehow seems more secure because it's not out there on the internet to be attacked remotely. but. USB devices can be lost. They can fail more easily. OK, now I've not lost just one password. I've lost 200 when this USB device has failed or been lost. And let's, again, take human nature into account. If you are using your password manager multiple times during the day, and I know that I am, where is this USB device going to live? it's going to be plugged into the USB port on your computer all day, which means it's online on your computer all day for anyone who hacks into your machine. So some of the security benefits of having it on this offline device are a little bit more illusory than you would think. And of course, it's plugged into your computer, in your office, you go home, oh no, I forgot my USB device. It's in my office. I can't go pay my bills tonight because I can't log on to my bank. Dropbox will store it in a file, but can also sync. I'm sorry, sorry, Dropbox. One password can actually synchronize with its own custom LAN protocol. It's not. If all of the computers you want to use are on the same LAN, say your phone, your laptop, and your tablet, that's great. If that protocol is secure, is it? I've never analyzed it. Track record at developing secure protocols is, shall we say, not inspiring. Cryptographic protocols are notoriously hard to get right. So there are security issues, and there are usability issues, and there are stability issues that have to be looked at with any of these password managers. There's no one choice that's right, necessarily right for everyone. Some of them store passwords on their own website, and that's the way you retrieve it. You log into their website. This means that someone who can break your log into that website can get at at least the encrypted versions of the passwords. Last password had a problem with that a few years ago. And then it comes to the question of how do you use the password manager? Turns out that many, though not all of them, are integrated with the browsers in some fashion. They use browser extensions. When you get to a site that demands the login, the password manager extension notes which site you're at, and when you unlock it by typing your decryption key, it pops up or even automatically fills in the login form on that web page. It's extremely convenient, and this is what I mean by near the browser. How hard is it to get the password from this password store, whether it's the piece of paper, a separate program or the browser extension into the login page on the uh, screen in your browser. If it's integrated with the browser, it's very easy. You just click something. 
it's perfect. But if the browser has been compromised, we've got a long history of browsers being compromised. In fact, you know, well, Firefox releases a new, uh, a, a new version, what, every six, eight weeks? Every one of them has a security patches. Internet Explorer has security patches about once every month or every other month. Chrome, you know, Google just pushes out the browser updates when they feel like pushing out browser updates. But browsers have security problems. They're large, complicated pieces of code. Of course, they have security problems. Which means that if the browser's compromised, some, and the extension is there, then the malware that's penetrated your browser can ask the password manager extension, give me a list of passwords, please. And that's the problem with Near. You've got this tension between the usability aspect and the security aspect. In fact, there's even a security aspect to having it near. I don't ever type a password into a website. It gets filled in for me. Which means that if I go to paypa1.com, my browser extension is going to say, I don't have any stored passwords for paypa1.com. I don't recognize this site. It won't be fooled by Cyrillic characters or one looking like an L. So there are security advantages on both sides of the equation. Which is a bigger risk? As I said yesterday, my favorite answer is it depends. Let's turn now again back to the site side of it. How do you recover from lost passwords? Because people will forget their passwords. How you do it is going to be very, very heavily dependent on your operational procedures and the kind of website. I'm not going to give one specific answer, though I'll talk about a few options. If it's an IT department where people are involved, be extremely cautious about the proper procedures and insist that the help desk people Strictly follow the procedures, even if it means inconveniencing the CEO who forgot her password while she's on a trip halfway around the world. Because there's an attack technique known as social engineering. It's known as being a con artist. And this is designed to trick people into doing what they shouldn't do, what you want them to do, what the attacker wants them to do. The purpose of process and procedure, look, we're all geeks. We, hate pro we like code, we hate process and paperwork and procedure. It's really necessary here. And you know what you do? You test. About once a month, maybe even more often, you have someone from the security group call up the help desk and say, I forgot my password, and try to con them into doing something that's against the procedures. It's amazing how often you succeed. And I mentioned yesterday about six months, for six months walking into my office, showing my badge, which looked like this. And one day the guard stopped me. It was a new guard. It was her first week on the job. He said, excuse me, sir, I can't see your picture. And I congratulated her <laughs> as being the first security guard in six months to notice what I was doing. Wow, she'd been tested and she had passed the test. <laughs> and for the next year, she was the best of all the security guards at actually looking at the badges. The badges. Most places that aren't high security places don't really take badge security seriously. There's a story I heard at Bell Labs. It's one of these stories, if it wasn't true, it should be. <laughs> Two guys got into a discussion about whether or not the security guards actually looked at the pictures on the badge. And uh, they finally decided to make a bet. They, one of them found a picture of a gorilla's head, about the right size of the picture on his badge. He cut it out and taped it over his, his picture on the badge. And he said, okay, I'm going to walk out and come back in, and I'll see if the guard stops me. He, he goes out to the parking lot. The other guy, meanwhile, calls the guard and said, here's what to do. Guy walks in, flashes the gorilla badge, starts to walk by. The guard says, excuse me, let me see that badge. 
looks at it, looks down at the picture, looks up, okay, you're you. <laughs> Process, procedure. <laughs> Secondary authentication, I keep talking about it. It's a very hard problem because you want questions that have to be memorable to the user, but not guessable by an outsider or attackable or findable. In an era of social networks, that's very, very hard. Yeah. What was your first pet's name? Is that on your Facebook page? It's doubly hard if you're a celebrity, of course. Will there be 17 different tabloid stories with that? The classic question, what is your mother's maiden name? I found evidence, I stumbled on looking at old telegraph code books. It's a hobby of mine. Looking at one from 1882 that's now in the, in the Library of Congress in the U.S. in Washington. And I found this example to send in a telegram. Identity could be established, a party will answer that his or her mother's maiden name is. 1882, they were using mother's maiden name as an authenticator. Great. His now, mother's name was <laughs> that's, the, that's the telegraph code word for it, for the, that you send that in the telegram instead. Actually, this is a whole separate interesting story. The reason I, this particular code book for 1882 was interesting is this code book invented the one-time pad 35 years before uh, Vernon and Malborn, who were credited with inventing it. So that, you can find that story in a cryptographic history paper on my website, but that's why I know, remember this particular, particular one. It sounds like the sort of attack that only a targeteer is going to mount. Doing research on this person's uh, you know, high school, first date, what have you. But for some of these questions, like mother's maiden name, well, in many jurisdictions, Marriage records and birth records have been digitized and put online. It's great for people doing genealogy research. It's great for people who want to learn somebody else's mother's maiden name. By the way, when we got married, my wife did not change her name. Therefore, her maiden name is her name today. So my kids had better not use that as an answer to a question. When people forget their passwords, how do you recover? Do you reset the password or generate or send them the old one, password recovery? You can only do password recovery if you have stored the plain text password. You don't ever want to store plain text passwords. Richie and Thompson's advice on that was quite correct, though as we shall see, there are problems with it. So you, can, you always want to do password reset. And if they're going to set it back to one of the same three or four passwords, well, you can't do much about that. So how do you do password reset? You mail or even password recovery. You email it to them. That's what 99% of websites do. And this means that the password is going to be sitting in their email account. And someone who breaks into their email account will probably find a whole bunch of password reset emails, maybe in the uh, trash messages file, deleted messages file. If you tried deleting a uh, message from your Gmail account, yeah. Some are time limited. Some of them are time limited. Some are, some are not. And some people, rather than use a password manager, mail themselves the password, because they always remember the Gmail password or what have you. Twitter got hacked that way about five years ago. One of the site administrators kept his Twitter administrator password in his Gmail account, which had a nice guessable password. The attacker broke into it, got his administrator password, and was able to do a lot of mischief. Twitter got into trouble with the US Federal Trade Commission for that because of you know, lack of uh, stronger authentication for administrators and lack of proper training. If it's a really important password, you do not want to email the password because this email account password is so strong and so rather is so important. If I reset my bank account password, they're going to mail it to me, physical piece of paper email, mail, not email. And yes, someone who's targeting me can come by the house in the afternoon when I'm at work 
and check my mailbox to see if there's an envelope that looks like it's from a bank. Again, that's a targeted attack and a very serious one requiring physical proximity. Another very good way for many places is text message. Text messages are not very secure. It's not encrypted. The phone company can read them and so on. But it's not the same channel as the computer. The attacker would have to have your phone, or maybe malware on your phone, and your account. So it's considerably stronger. Resetting the, forcing the, re, the, forcing the, the password to be changed after they use the uh, reset uh, URL or something that you email them. The reason for doing that, most of that's to do with the security of the email account. Some places say, oh no, it's horrible. The system's going to know the user's password. The system knows the user's password anyway. What's the problem? This is random. It's not stored in the password file. Not a big deal. So do password files still get compromised the way Richie and Thompson were worried? And the answer is quite clearly yes. <clears throat> LinkedIn, RockU, Adobe, many big companies have had their password files stolen. Hundreds of millions of passwords have been compromised that way. We know that for sure because there are databases out there that you can find. I've got the RockU data set on my laptop with 33 million. Makes for fascinating reading. People are using, what is a password? Once that happens, you're in very big trouble because you have to reset all of your users' passwords, which tells you a few things. One, do you have the operational ability to do it? When do you write the, the code that it lets you reset everybody's password? Before the compromise, it me, is the time wasted. After the compromise, you had better write that code in a hurry. It's just one of these things you need to be able to do because the odds on it happening are too high to be neglected. Yeah, maybe you're good enough. I've never heard of Facebook or Google's password files being compromised. But I also would not be uh, astonished if I ever did hear of it. A little surprised, both of those companies are very, very good, but so are a lot of other companies like uh, RSA, who have been hacked. Another interesting question, were the secondary authentication questions compromised? Of the file of mother's maiden names and first pets and uh, favorite colors and so on. That's a lot harder to recover from because people, there's just a small set of questions people are going to remember, you know. I, I have this habit of uh, lying on these secondary authentication questions, but then I have to remember which lies I used where. <laughs> What's your favorite color? Chartreuse. Okay, do I even remember, did I say chartreuse? Or did I say ecru or magenta? Which website? And how were the passwords stored? Were they stored in plain text or better protected? If you store passwords in plain text, it's outright disaster, immediate. Again, there are too many sites that do that. If you have a low value site and if people don't, did not reuse passwords, you'd say, well, okay, I'm gonna reset all the passwords anyway. Nothing much to do about, don't have to worry about it. But people do reuse passwords. So it is a disaster. Some sites just, okay, we don't do it clear text, but we want password recovery. One site, uh, Adobe, big sophisticated company that should know better, encrypted the passwords and in ECB mode. If you know anything about cryptography, one of the things you learn about day two is never use ECB mode for, store, for any real encryption. And uh, that's what Adobe used. They used triple DES in ECB mode. The first approach, the better approach, the ones more commonly used is to hash the passwords. One-way hash. And the server, when someone logs in, takes the entered password, hashes that, compares it with the stored hash. If it matches, the user typed the correct password and you're in. 
A better scheme, and this again goes back to Morris and Thompson, is to salt the password before you hash. You know, the generic attack. You have a large dictionary of words if you're the attacker. And you look at every entry in the dictionary and simple variants of it. Replace the letter O by a zero. Replace the letter E by a three. All the usual transformations that people invent, and everyone thinks they're oh so clever for coming up with this transformation that no hacker would ever think of. And then you just go look to see if this hashed variant of your large, every word in your large dictionary matches anything in the password store. If so, you've got a hit. So we, uh, you know, that's, that's the generic attack. And the trick to the defense is you want to slow it down. This is a fairly you know, high computational complexity, you've got nested loops. Can we slow this process down? And that is the key to the defenses we need to try. The attacker has some guess rates, n tries a second. No matter how good the attacker is, it could be the NSA with the new supercomputer center they're building in Utah. n will be large, but n is still not infinity. If we iterate the hash m times, we have cut the guessing, effective guessing rate by a factor of m. When I look at modern hash functions, m should be in the hundreds of thousands, range of the hundreds of thousands. Again, no matter how good the attacker is, we have cut down their guessing rate by a factor of hundreds of thousands. Driven up the cost or let them check fewer variants or fewer words from that dictionary. It is important to remember that's a dictionary. And it's not just a dictionary of English or Hebrew, but lots of the world's languages, made up languages, science fiction terms. When I read the Morris and Thompson paper in 79, I was in grad school, I said, cool, and I implemented the attack, ran it against my department's password file, Went to a friend and said, Greg, you need to change your password. What do you mean I need to change my password? It's abscissa. How do you know that? I, I ran this cracking program. Well, nobody, it's a complicated word. Nobody else is going to remember how to spell it. I don't need to change it. Didn't understand the threat model. Well, it's 1979. You can forgive people for not understanding that threat then. We also want to salt the passwords. So what is the salt? You pick a random number s, and you calculate rather than h to the m of the password, you concatenate s with the password, and then iterate it m times. And you store that in s. When someone enters their password, again, you look at this plain text value s, do the concatenation, do the iterated hash, and so on. Two very big advantages there. One. The attacker cannot pre-calculate a large dictionary. So I've got my dictionary of five billion words and variants, and I do professional password crack and constantly stealing more sites. I will just calculate the hashes, even the iterated hashes of all my billions of words, and store this, disk space is cheap today, and then it just becomes a simple lookup problem. But if I'm going to salt the passwords, and every salt is unique, I can't recalculate. Because today I'd recommend at least a 64-bit salt, maybe 128 bits. You cannot store 2 to the 64th times any rational number of dictionary size. No attacker can do that, not even the NSA. It also hides the fact that two hash passwords are identical. Two hash passwords, I should say, represent the same plain text password. The Morris and Thompson paper used a 12-bit salt, partly for implementation reasons, the way they actually did the salting. But again, a large site then had a few hundred users. You really want every salt to be unique. Today, uh, a large site has tens of millions of users, maybe hundreds of millions. Facebook has over a billion users. When I start looking at the probability of random number overlap with the billion users, I really want more than 64 bits of salt. And random numbers are relatively cheap. These don't even need to be cryptographically strong random numbers. So which hash function? Oh, no, don't use MD5. It's been cracked. Well, no. 
MD5 has been cracked for the purpose of finding collisions. It's not been inverted. There are no pre-image attacks known on MD5, let alone MD5 iterated 150,000 times. And that's my estimate for how many times you should repeat it. But we want to slow it down enough. So if I have a faster hash function, I iterate more. What's really important is the time it takes to do the hash. And from the server's pers perspective, the calculation is how many CPU cores can I throw at the uh, password hashing process? What is my login rate? Not even how many users do I have. It's how many users are logging in per second. How many cores can I do the calculation on? And what is the acceptable time for a user to wait before they're told password incorrect or welcome to the site? That is the equation to calculate. You know, Morris and Thompson looked for about one second. I think that's probably too long today. Tenth of a second, twentieth of a second is probably fine. Iterate enough times to get to that point. Throw CPUs at it. If you can't afford enough CPUs, cut the iteration count by some amount. Be careful not to use a hash function that limits the character set or limits the password length. Why a 12 character limit? There's no good reason. The output of MD5, the output of SHA-256 can be the same length no matter how long the user's password is. The only rational reason for limiting the input length is how many characters do I think the user can type without making a mistake? and annoying, getting annoyed because they keep typing the password incorrectly. But no artificial limits. Some people are better typers than others. There are odder and less common ways to use passwords. One of the most interesting, he never, never named, is due to Leslie Laport, you know, the Turing Award winner, known more for other things. But this was a very interesting short paper, I think, communication to the ACM about 30 years ago. And this is a way to use a conventional human-typed password in a way that prevents these replay attacks. Doesn't prevent guessing attacks, but prevents replay attacks. In addition to the usual iterated hash of a password, we're actually going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to pick a number n, and we're going to calculate h to the n of the password. And that's what we're going to store. We're going to store n and h to the n of the password. Now the user enters their password to the site. In fact, the user doesn't enter the password. The user calculates, how we'll get to in a moment, h to the n minus 1. Entered. Great. Now I hash it again at the site. h of h to the n minus 1 is h to the n and I compare it with what I've got stored. If it matches, I overwrite the stored password with the, with what the user sent me, h to the n minus 1. This means that the next time the user logs in, they have to send me h to the n minus 2. You cannot invert this function by definition. Therefore, you cannot go backwards. So the user is logging in with h to the n minus 1, h to the n minus 2, h to the n minus 3, and so on. And no password is ever replayable because you're never really in, you're never sending the root password over the wire. So it can't be replayed if captured by a phishing site. And how does the user calculate it? Well, two possibilities. One, users have local computational capability. I've got a great local cap uh, computational capability today. I can go type my password on this. It's not going to be transmitted. It's not going to be stored. Instead, it's going to go, if I know n, I'll calculate h to the n minus 1 on this and copy and paste it into the login site. If you think your users don't have secure computational capability, they're going to go on a trip. Before they go on a trip, they run a program locally on a trusted computer and calculate, OK, I'll need 20 or 30 passwords for this trip. Let me print out the next 30 for h to, the n, h to the n minus 1 through h to the n minus 30. And they take that piece of paper with them on this trip. Phishing website. It doesn't guard against keystroke loggers. It does, again, not a threat in 1983. 
It does guard against phishing websites. It does guard against wiretapping because the password over the wire is never reused. It's got, yeah. Why is it better than challenge? Why is it better than challenge? I'll, 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 it's not, necessar it's not necessarily, well, you'll see, depending on how you do challenge response, it might be better. I'll come to that, that in a few minutes. I'm tossing this out as another alternative for, lo for logins. Uh, the choice of n is, has a very interesting property. You can only log in n minus one times with any root password. The mathematics of this scheme force a password change. If you believe in password changes, that becomes a very attractive property. You may not believe in, ma in rapid, you know, mandatory password changes. I don't. But if you do, here's something you can say, no, it's not me. It's not my policy is forcing it. It's the mathematics of this. And you don't want n to be too high because that takes too much uh, calculation time. Lamport's algorithm is a form of one-time password a password that's used only once. Most of the other forms of one-time password require some kind of device or token, something you have. Sometimes we use cryptography for challenge response, sometimes not. Usually if you're going to use a token, you accompany that with a password or PIN to guard against stolen or lost tokens. Tokens have a lot of advantages. Guessing attacks don't work because, pat because tokens can store you know, 128-bit random secrets. No one, not even the NSA, not even the Andromedans, are going to guess a 128-bit random number. Well, NSA might be tampering with the random number generator again, but that's different, again, different threat model. If I lend out my login token to somebody, then I don't have it and I can't log in which limits uh, my willingness to lend it out, especially if my token is my phone. Thank you, I need my phone. Generally speaking, the authentication code isn't replayable. Though there was an interesting problem with, uh, an interesting attack that I saw called the last digit guessing attack. And this goes back to when people were using unencrypted login sessions because they didn't have ways to encrypt it. And the wiretapper is, listening in, and someone's logging in, they're typing the digits for the challenge response, and the wiretappers has set up 10 parallel login sessions for the same user, and okay, six digit response, digit one, replay digit one to all 10 login sessions, digit two, same thing, digit five. At this point, the real user and the 10 fake login sessions have all sent the first five digits. And yeah, you, you, you got it already. Now the attacker on the 10 login session sends 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, rather more quickly than the real user can type that last digit. Last digit guessing attack. Tokens can be lost, they can be stolen, they can be reverse engineered if the attacker is good enough and the token design is bad enough to steal this secret. So, challenge response authentication. The server sends X to the user. The user replies with some function of X. Common way to do it is cryptographically. You encrypt X or X minus one with some secret key K. The K is known to the server. K is known to the user. Seems like a very strong form of authentication. Indeed it is if you've guarded against this last digit guessing attack. There's a non-cryptographic variant that's become widely used on the web. Send a text message to the user's phone. Then the user has to uh, have, then the attacker has to have the phone in order to see the text message and just reply with that challenge. In fact, PayPal does that today. This is me logging into PayPal. After I type my password, I can tap uh, send SMS, get the text message on my phone, type it into PayPal, great. If you look at the screen a little bit carefully though, I don't know if you can read this over here. What does this button say over here? I don't have my security key with me. We're gonna go back to secondary authentication. 
Step challenge response, we're back to secondary authentication. Users lose phones too, or don't have it with them. They want to go buy something and PayPal doesn't want to drive away paying customers. Systems problem, you've got to take into account that this kind of thing can and will happen. Virtually all computer users, though, have mobile phones today. And people take their phone rather more seriously than their employee password. If you lose your phone, you're going to know about it, you're going to do something about it very rapidly. There is malware out there, in particular for Android, which intercepts these challenge response text messages and relays them to the attacker. The bad guys do not stand still. And of course, you're trusting the phone company. This is not a secure encrypted channel. Probably not a threat for most users. If you're an intelligence agency or you're targeted by an intelligence agency, you want to take that into account. There's an, I should mention one other problem with this cryptographic uh, challenge response. I forget if I have this another slide on it. K is known to the server and to the user's device. This means that the server has to have a plain text file with all of these keys. But we already said that plain text files are pretty <coughs> dangerous servers to have. Yeah, okay. There, uh, a very popular one-time password device uses cryptography a little bit differently. It's the secure ID token that's been around yeah, about 25 to 30 years, I believe. The token knows the time of day, T, and some secret key, K. The server knows K also. And the device, once a minute, display, in, encrypts the time, displays the last few digits of the time. And because you can't depend on the clock on this device running as accurately as the clock on the computer, the server just looks at time within a certain interval and tries to match it. In fact, it tries to measure the clock skew of the token and adapt the time on a per token basis. And this one-time password over here is uh, what you use to log in. You know, these three little hash marks over here show how much time is left before the uh, value changes on that token. Those are, so in this case, it's 30 seconds, the three hash marks. Very good device, very secure device. It's been used successfully for quite a long time. I, I keep mentioning authentication as a systems problem. The re one of the reasons that uh, Secure ID succeeded in the marketplace when many of their competitors did not, is they were not just selling tokens, they were selling a complete package. Of including all the administrative software and all the ho server end software that you needed to use these one-time passwords instead of the Unix login or the Windows login or what have you. So they supplied the complete package to people. Made it a lot easier to deploy than other tokens that you, people might regard as uh, better cryptographically. But for cryptographic Challenge response and secure ID, the server must have a database of keys. This database is very, very sensitive because if, it's comp if I have that database of secure ID keys, I can impersonate any token. That's a fairly serious threat, isn't it? We can't risk storing plain text passwords where we can store these keys. Why do I think that my site can protect this key database better? If I use asymmetric cryptography, it's a different story. But secure IDs do not use asymmetric cryptography. They use symmetric crypt crypto. They're using, I believe they're using AES today for doing this uh, encryption. Could use a secure hash function instead. And the real world threats to some of these systems come from the system's nature of the problem. Where does K come from? More precisely, I'm the IT department. I just got in a shipment, a box with a thousand secure ID tokens, every one of which has a 128-bit random AES key. There are no obvious openings or jacks or whatever 
on the back, side, top, bottom, whatever of those tokens. You cannot plug something in to program in a new key. They are factory manufactured with the key built in. So where does, how do I get these thousand random keys into my database to assign to the next thousand users I hand these tokens to? When I read the secure ID documentation, it seems to come probably on a CD, maybe over the internet, from the vendor. So I get a box with the keys and I get a CD, I get a file with all of the passwords, all of these cryptographic secrets. So the vendor knows, or at least at one point knew, what the key was, what K was, for every single one of these tokens. If you're a security person, this means you need to start wondering a little bit. Where did those K, K uh, that set of a thousand Ks come from? And what does the vendor know now? And people, I think most people were not worrying about this until a few years ago when Lockheed, major defense contractor, was hacked, apparently using data that was stolen from RSA, the manufacturer of these tokens, by allegedly Chinese hackers. What, was ha what happened? RSA has never disclosed what was stolen. But we know that they're generating these keys somehow and giving them to the users. There are two fairly obvious ways that, are, that they could be doing it. One, maybe there's a secret key, we'll call it capital K, per customer. One for Lockheed, one for Boeing, one for F the FBI, whatever. And you generate K sub I by encrypting the serial number of the token with the per customer key. That's one possible way. I don't know if this is what they're doing. But there's a master key per customer. And if this master key for Lockheed were stolen, and the attackers had some hint of what the range of serial numbers were, then they could generate this list of Ks as well. Or maybe RSA is really using a hardware random number generator, but they're still sending a file. And are they storing this file with the thousand S sub I, K sub I pairs? What if their customer has lost the copy of the file and they've got this crate with you know, 493 of them left? Okay, we'll say, okay, here's a backup copy of your file to import into your administrative system. Something was stolen from RSA that let the attackers into Lockheed. We don't know what it was because it's never said, but we do know that RSA is also shipping customers a key file with the tokens. There's one more curious thing about that attack. When I log in, I'm not typing in the serial number of the token, which is stamped on the back. I'm typing in my login name. Where do the attackers get a list of login names? Well, high-end attacker, again, presumably a government. But how do they match the login names? How do they match you know, SMB Steve, or Stephen Dot Bellevin or whatever to 1278349? which is the serial number of my token. Because that's all RSA knows is the serial numbers of the token, not the user login names. It's a very interesting question, isn't it? There was more information out there somehow, or a very massive brute force attack. We don't know what happened. The details have never been published. But this is what I mean when I talk about authentication being a system problem. We had a very secure device. That, but the key file was compromised indirectly, not directly, or the information to generate the key file and the mapping of usernames to keys and the username list was somehow compromised. Authentication is a systems problem. What do you do about lost tokens? People will lose their tokens. People lose their laptops, and those are a lot bigger and more expensive. 
The CEO is traveling. She's halfway around the world. And her bag was grabbed on the street, and she had her secure ID token in it and her phone in it. And she needs to log in to download the presentation that she's going to give to a major customer. And she's not even on her laptop because she was afraid that the laptop was going to be stolen or in transit, so she's going to store it safely on the company's servers and download it when she gets to her destination. That's advice you often see, by the way. How do you authenticate this traveling executive? How do you let them log in temporarily before they get the replacement token? How do you get the replacement token to them securely, possibly through customs, curious hotel clerks, and prying governments? This is a systems problem. You've got to solve all of these problems because dealing with lost credentials is not only a problem for passwords. The, recover, the secondary authentication, the temporary login procedures or reset the login, what have you, protecting the authentication database, the file of K rather than the file of passwords, is at least as complicated for token-based authentication as it is for password-based authentication. These are very hard problems in the password space, and they're not any easier in the token space. We've gotten away from guessing. We may or may not have gotten away from forgetting, but we haven't gotten away from loss. Now, there's a physical object to lose, a more sensitive data file, and the same problem of secondary authentication, which, as I said, is a very, very challenging problem. Yes? Uh, what do you have to say about uh, the uh, applications that replace the security features, mobile pass, and, uh, they're on phones, and they replace the... Uh... The tokens? Okay, yeah. So some people, they're so-called soft tokens. It's an app you run on your phone, which has this same cryptographic secret, goes through the same algorithm with the time of day and so on. It's a cheaper alternative. People take care of their phones. But again, phones get lost, phones get stolen, uh, and maybe there's a malware app that's going to try to steal the secret out of the app. It's, the, most of the properties are the same. It's less resistant to an electronic attack by, by uh, a rogue app, especially on Android. Uh, we see more of them out there on Android. And it's not as resistant to reverse engineering. One of the properties that very valuable about these tokens is that the user doesn't know K and can't share it with somebody else. If I lend my token to you, then I don't have it and I can't log in. Whereas if I can reverse engineer the application I can extract K from it, if I'm a rogue user, then I can share it. So it's, so, it's less expensive. It's a bit more convenient because I don't have to carry two gadgets with me, carry an extra bulky gadget on my key ring, but it's not as secure. It's not necessarily the wrong answer. Again, as I said yesterday, insecurity is not a state of sin, it's an economic decision. You're, you're, look, you're balancing security against convenience here and cost. And depending on how high your security needs are, you make the decision appropriately. Sometimes we do authentication as a side effect of a cryptographic session establishment, such as Kerberos or client-side certificates in TLS. This is attractive because you probably need to do it using encrypted sessions these days anyway. We're not in the hard copy teletype age anymore. But there are still limits to the security we're going to get. The biggest problem is where does the user's key come from? whether it's a private key for an asymmetric algorithm like RSA or a uh, secret key for something like AES, it's still a key. It's still got to be, it's a long random number now. You can't memorize it. It's got to be protected because this is at the core of your authentication. So am I going to store it on my computer? 
How am I going to protect it? With a passphrase? Just like a password manager. I've got this strong secret protected by a, a user type passphrase. It may still be possible to do guessing attacks. On, at least on some versions of Kerberos, it's possible to do guessing attacks. Or mention that uh, I co-invented the EKE uh, algorithm about a bit over 20 years ago for uh, strongly protecting uh, login sessions with the user password. Our motivation was that we were looking at Kerberos and realized that Kerberos, the ticket granting ticket, was encrypted with the user's password. And therefore, you, you pick this up over the wire. You could do a password guessing attack. If I have multiple client devices, I still have to get my cryptographic key on these multiple different devices. Store it outboard in a USB key? Well, it's rather hard to plug a USB key into most phones. I still have to have ways to recover from lost gadgets, lost USB get, uh, tokens, lost laptops and what have you. I still have the lost credential recovery problem. It does give me the ability to use public key cryptography for, the cha for a challenge response, this gets away from the sensitive password file problem on the server. This is about the only solution that strongly gets away from that problem. But there are still limitations, especially the lost credential one. This biometric authentication, something you have, something you are, fingerprints, iris scans, retina scans, hand geometry, facial recognition, lots of different things have been tried over the years. Typing rhythm. The way I type my password is moderately unique, it turns out. This has been measured experimentally. A lot of different things that have been tried. You know, people don't like looking into retina scanners. It's laser-based. You want me to shine a watt into my eye? Hmm. You know where you use ret uh, I, where a lot of these uh, iris scanners are used? Borders. When I went to Jordan to visit Petra, they, had, they did an iris scan crossing the border going into Jordan. Didn't have a choice, going through border crossing security. For my job, you want me to do what? To log into my computer every day? No, thank you. Marketing materials by biometrics vendors suggest it's perfectly secure. Again, there are issues. If the server's database is compromised, can somebody recreate the bio, a fake biometric? A lot of these biometric devices are not particularly good at telling a real fingerprint from a fake one. Gummy bear candies have been used to produce fake, you know, re replayable fingerprints. Some facial recognition camera things have been re fooled by, hold up a picture in front of your face. There's at least one news report of a severed finger being used to start a car that have, had a fingerprint reader. I don't know if it's true or not. It's BBC, reputable news source, said this happened in Malaysia to start a, a car. A lot of the higher end biometric sensors have liveness detectors. Make sure this really feels like a live finger. How do I change my password? I've only got 10 fingers. <laughs> Injuries. You know, this finger over here, I've, I, I have a scar right down the middle of the fingerprint area on this finger. Would that confuse a fingerprint reader the day after I got that injury? Never mind the fact that for two weeks after the injury I had a big bandage over it. I can't log in because I've cut my finger. Voice prints and you have a cold. My voice after this talk is not going to be the same as my voice before this talk. Bio, it's not very easy, not impossible, but not very easy to convert a biometric into a cryptographic key. But it turns out that on your laptop, on your phone, your password or PIN are used to encrypt certain sensitive data, like the keychain file on a Mac and the cor corresponding file on Windows. Not as easy to do that with a biometric. Not impossible, but not as easy. It's very hard to get uh, a lot of bits out of a fingerprint because you're reading it only approximately. There's nothing to forget or lose, but there's injury, there's disease, and it turns out that 
about five, three to five percent of people have fingerprints that are not easily scannable. Who's the person I heard this from? Director of the National Biometric Test Lab in the U.S. He's among that five percent. When my sister uh, went to the global entry way to go skip the lines of immigration in the U.S., uh, couldn't scan her fingerprint. The guy said, "Okay, rub your finger on your forehead. The skin oils will improve the contrast of the ridges on your finger." That worked. It's a problem. Again, you've got this systems nature of the authentication problem, and the sensors have to be properly made. Sensors have to be properly maintained, and so on. And although technology in the biometric space is improving rapidly, it's still not perfect. And there's always going to be the false accept rate and the false reject rate. People whose, creden whose biometric you, biometrics you accept when you shouldn't or reject when you should accept it. Worse yet, there's a trade-off. The more tightly I tune it to keep the false accept rate very low, you know, I, I'm worried about spies or terrorists coming in to, uh, you know, through the border. So I'm going to get to a very, very low false accept rate. That's going to increase the false reject rate. There's an inevitable trade-off in that process. What do you do as a matter of policy and process for handling these false rejects? And can you set the false accept rate low enough to meet your security concerns? All of this is very important procedurally. It's not the same as the systems issues for passwords or tokens, but there are still systems issues. There's federated authentication. Be starting to become popular on the web, you log into Google or Facebook or some such, and it vouches for you to some other sites. There are a number of fascinating problems there. One, huh, is your password for Facebook strong enough? Suddenly this password that's only to a social network is now letting you into a more valuable resource. Is this a secure thing to do? Is this company reliable? Is it trustworthy? I do not walk into work using the credit card from my bank. This is the way the bank knows who I am. But thank you, my employer wants me to use it, the badge that it issued me, not my banks. What if that site is compromised? Now it's letting people into lots of other sites. A password failure at Facebook has now compromised not just Facebook, but many, many other sites. There are privacy issues. Google and Facebook and so on like this because it lets them know other websites you visit, and they're in the data collecting business. There's been some uptake of this on the web among sites that don't want to run their own authentication and authentication recovery systems. It's not been very popular yet among uh, internal uses by organizations, though the U.S. government uncountably seems to like this concept. We call it NSTIC, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, which is the wrong solution to the wrong problem, but I, I digress. So again, authentication is a systems problem. We've always got the need for secondary authentication, including for biometrics when you get the false reject, server compromise, susceptibility to guessing attacks, the administrative infrastructure, and all of these things that we've seen interact. I put together this chart. I'm not going to try to go through it in detail right now. You can argue with a few of the entries. But different kinds of problems, like the server file compromise, for different kinds of the different types of authentication I have talked about. One of the things, the most important takeaway, is that there is no row on this column that's all check marks. That's always good. There are no perfect solutions to the authentication problem. Most of the Complaints about passwords are dealing with the first or first two columns. And you see most of the other types of authentication are much better with those first two columns than password. But the density of check marks in the last column is a lot less for any of these types of authentication. Which is why I say that authentication is not 
They solve problem no matter which technology you choose to use instead of passwords. Again, these slides will be on my website. I'm not going to try to go through this chart in detail right now. I'm already one minute over. So no perfect solutions. Everything has got its shortcomings. And of course, there's always cost. Passwords are not going to go away. They're simple and understandable, and everybody knows how to use them. And they seem to be low cost. But the recovery problem from lost passwords, guest passwords, stolen password files is not trivial. And you've got all these other costs besides. We really need to ha learn to handle all this stuff properly because here's this chart. No check marks all the way across. Thanks.